When we produce speech, the production of speech sounds is always affected by the context where the sounds are found. In producing speech, the articulators are moving through a rapid sequence of articulatory targets, and it's often the case that the articulators don't reach the same point they would uh, as they would for a speech sound that's produced in isolation. We can describe different things that happen in co-articulation uh, with a few different terms. One is assimilation. In assimilation, adjacent speech sounds that use the same articulator use a single combined articulatory gesture for both sounds. So for example, in the phrase, I miss you, the uh, S and the Y phonemes both require the use of the tongue tip and blade. As a result, the S, the S sound, is often produced with the palatal gesture of the Y, resulting in something that seems more like um, the palatal fricative SH. Similar sequences are found in other combinations of alveolars with palatals, like in did you. Here we have a spectrogram of I miss you, where you can see a um, mid to high level energy uh, concentration, a little bit higher than we might expect for the palatal fricative, where the loudest part would be around 2500. Um, uh, but the high-end um, noise that's seen here is probably lower than it typically is for a S sound. Another term uh, for co-articulation is co-production, which is pretty much how the textbook refers to um, co-articulation. In co-production, uh, Two speech sounds that are next to each other that use different articulators can be overlapped in their production. So for example, a s alveolar fricative phoneme doesn't require the use of the lips. So if there's lip rounding in an adjacent sound, like an oo vowel, that can begin during the s. So if you listen carefully to the s in seat versus the s in suit, um, there uh, is an audible difference. Similarly, the burst in something like T versus 2 uh, will have a, a different frequency components because of the early presence of lip rounding. Another really common example of this, as probably mentioned in uh, a phonetics class, would be nasalization during a vowel when a vowel precedes a nasal consonant. Here we have a spectrogram um, showing a seat on the left and suit on the right. Uh, in the spectrogram on the left, we have some high energy noise, but actually the loudest part of this noise is above 5000 hertz, where we can't see it on this spectrogram. In the case of suit, the loudest energy concentration is in between 4000 and 5000, uh, reflecting that frequency being lowered by the presence of lip rounding. Another type of co-articulation uh, is referred to as hypo-articulation. In hypo-articulation, there is um, variation in how much articulators re reach that ideal articulatory target. Um, so we can have very careful and precise speech, which is referred to as hyper-articulation. Um, most speech, especially in like a casual conversation, would have hypo-articulation, uh, where pronunciations undershoot the articulatory targets. For example, when one is speaking fairly quickly, the corner vowels often don't make it all the way to their corner vowel articulations, and consequently this will affect um, the form and frequencies that you get. Here we have a production of dude versus dude, where the vowel is extended considerably. You look at the location of the uh, second formant, for example, in the short production on the left, the second formant is uh, somewhat high, um, coming from the d onset toward the u vowel. Uh, in the production on uh, the right that is longer, uh, the second formant gets down to a lower value, but then it does start to go back up again because of 
the core articulation with the coda D, and in particular compared to an U vowel in isolation, there's some space between the first formant and the second formant that we normally wouldn't expect to see, um, which suggests that this U vowel does not reach its high back position even in the longer version. So when we look at core articulation acoustically, like in the spectrogram examples that I've shown you, um, we see changes in formant frequencies on the basis of uh, core articulation with surrounding sounds. So if there's a assimilation happening where a, an articulation has been changed uh, from what it would normally be to combine two sounds together, or co-production where two articulations overlap with each other, we can get an acoustic result that's different from what we would see in isolation. In uh, many cases, probably in all cases, that combined articulation, whether by assimilation or co-production, has information about um, both or even more of the speech sounds that are combined together. And human brains are smart enough to figure this out. Um, and perceptual experiments have shown that um, the small changes to the acoustics of sounds on the basis of, say, an upcoming sound uh, can affect how people perceive speech. One of the most robust indicators of the uh, fact that there is continuous articulation and co-articulation between sounds is that the formants go through transitions. As articulatory positions change, the resonating frequencies of the vocal tract change, and these changing resonant frequencies then uh, result in changes in the formants of vowels or in resonant consonants. In addition, formant transitions in neighboring vowels are a commonly observed cue for the place of articulation of stops. Since stops are mostly silence, um, other non-silent parts of the speech are needed to determine um, which stop you're hearing. Here we have, for example, the three voiced stops at different places of articulation in English, ba, da, and ga. And if we look at the movement of uh, F1, F2, and F3 in um, these productions. Uh, we have a pattern where each one is uh, distinct from the other. A stylized version of those formant transitions is shown here. So in the case of ba, the first formant uh, rises from the ba into the a ah for all three formants. In the case of da, the second and third formants come down because um, of core articulation with the da leading into the uh. And in ga, the second and third formants seem to come from a uh, kind of similar middle location between the two um, before heading to the uh, formant values for the a uh vowel. Core articulation is most noticeable for sounds that are adjacent or next to one another, but there can be effects of core articulation for sounds that are two or three phonemes away, depending on a person's speech rate and the particular articulatory configuration. Uh, one example where this can often be seen is uh, the low F3 that we get for uh, rhotic sounds. Um, so in a word like every, um, there is the e eh, initial vowel, the v fricative before we get to a r sound, um, but you can see effects on F3 in that initial e eh vowel. So here is the uh, spectrogram of every with a r in it versus heavy, um, which does not have a r in it. The uh, initial h in heavy isn't going to affect what the tongue is doing because that's a laryngeal sound. Uh, and if we look at what F3 does between these two productions, it's brought down considerably uh, by the rhotic sound. Uh, and in fact, uh, F2 gets lowered as well by that rhotic sound in a noticeable way, even before we get to the fricative.